Hey, welcome back to Track Zero. It's really good to have you here, because today I want to share a really neat computer with you. What I have today is an SGI Personal Iris 4030. Now, obviously it's an SGI, so everybody likes collecting SGI stuff, right? And this one is extra cool because it's one of the older machines. It's not the oldest. There are a couple generations. They had machines that connected to mainframes, just as graphics hardware. Then they had a couple Motorola-based machines. And then they had these workstations. So these were actually in the first generation of their MIPS workstations. So it's old, check for me. It's unique, check for me. It's hard to get, check for me. I mean, you never see these on eBay. I don't know if anybody's looking. I don't know if they're really high demand, but I've only seen one on eBay in the last however long I've been looking, years, and uh, never seen one since. So the fact that I have one really kind of blows my own mind. This one I actually got for free from a guy at work um, because he had it sitting around and didn't need it anymore. He had this which is like amazing free stuff, especially like this kind of rare machine. You know, it never crosses your path. It's the, it's the dream of collecting and here it is in my house. Since it's not working, my intention is to just kind of give you a tour of this machine and give you an idea of what these even look like because you know, like I said, they're not around and that's why I wanted to share my Vex. That's why I wanted to share my Quadra, kind of. I guess the Quadra is pretty common, but a Quadra with AUX is uh, not so common, not so much video content out there. But especially this one. I don't know of anybody else with a, with a personal Iris video, so I want to show you how cool this thing is. It's a honking beast. It weighs a bajillion pounds. It's not nearly as pretty as the later SGIs, but I mean, it's, it's so early. That is just crazy neat. So, Without further ado, I'm, uh, let me cut over to me using a good mic that doesn't have this weird electrical noise in the background that I can't figure out. To me! Everyone knows SGI, the innovative graphics company with wild-looking workstations like the Octane, O2, and Tezero. But before those swoopy blue icons, there was this chunky purple box, the Personal Iris. The Personal Iris isn't the very first machine SGI ever marketed, but it is close. SGI's first products were the Iris 1000 series of machines, released around 1983, then the 2000 in 1985, and the 3000 in 1986. These machines were all based around a Motorola 68K processor, and run kind of a predecessor to Erix, known as Iris GL2 Unix, or many other names, and was a slightly tweaked version of Uniplus System 5 provided by Unisoft. Interestingly, the 1000 series mainboards were actually designed licensed from Andy Bechtelshim prior to his founding of Sun. These machines came as either a standalone workstation or a diskless version designed to be used as a graphics terminal add-on to existing computer systems. In 1987, SGI took the leap into the risk world that all the workstation vendors were finding so trendy at the time, and released the Professional Iris series of workstations running the MIPS processor in their distinctive twin tower cases, beginning their trend of wrapping their products in distinctive plastic skins. Soon thereafter, the protagonist of our story enters the scene. In 1988, SGI released their second generation of MIPS-based graphics systems in the form of a high-end visualization server known as the Power Series, and then the aptly named Personal Iris for desk-side workstation use. The initial models were the 4D20 and 4D25, with a 12.5 MHz R2000 and 20 MHz R3000 CPU, respectively. My model, housed in its enigmatically colored plastic skins, which appear to be a dark gray which is both not quite purplish and not quite brownish, is a 4D35, a later model released in 1991, and the final model of the personal iris that SGI would make before moving on to the more familiar Indigo and the cuboid crimson desk side that would star in Jurassic Park. My model is specifically a 4D35 Super Turbo, the Super Turbo portion describing the installed graphics option. At first glance, the personal iris may appear to be in the rough shape of your average PC mid-tower, but as you can see, it's most definitely in the desk side category, being around 50% larger in every dimension than my Pentium box, and absolutely dwarfing the diminutive O2. Also, here's what it looks like compared to a soft old mango. Oh yeah, and it is heavier than hell! To start tearing this thing down, the obvious first step is to pop open the front panel with that distinctive yellow SGI Cube logo silkscreened into it to reveal the first of two massive dual-height Seagate hard drives that I feel must make up at least a quarter of this thing's weight. 
Under this cover, we also find a basic control panel sporting the system's reset button, power and fault indicators, and a nice chunky power switch. Below the top door, there's another larger panel which pops off to reveal the second massive hard drive. Weirdly, while both of the drives slide out of the front of the machine and sit on these neat plug-and-go caddies, only the second drive slot sports a button which allows you to yank the drive out of the machine without opening the case. With both of the access panels explored, it's finally time to pull off those oddly colored skins and get into the guts of this thing. Pulling off the skins is a completely toolless operation which involves twisting this massive dial in the rear from locked to unlocked. After that, the two halves of the side skins slide right off the chassis. Sliding off the machine's left-hand panel reveals the heart of the machine, a steel box called the E-Module, which contains the main board and graphics of the machine. All of the machine's expansion ports run along the back edge of the E-Module, including audio inputs and outputs, a VME bus expansion, both HD15 and BNC video connections, a DIN connector for the keyboard and mouse, two Mac-style and two PC-style serial ports, a Genlock BNC and D-sub connector for syncing to the external video equipment, a normal 25-pin parallel port, and finally, an AUI connection for attaching an Ethernet Mac. You may have also noticed that there's a connector for external SCSI devices that's mounted to the inside wall of the chassis because... why not? After removing a couple of screws that I don't have anymore, the E-module tilts out to reveal a connection to the power supply, a small header that runs off to the front panel indicators and reset button, and 50-pin narrow SCSI. After removing each of these, the E-module simply lifts right out of the case. Pulling off the other skin reveals a big old sheet metal panel that shrouds the system cooling fan, the box for the lower hard drive, and a big long power supply. These original power supplies have a habit of going kaput, and unfortunately that was the situation with my machine when I got it. Theoretically, this can be swapped for a regular ATX power supply, but this machine calls for a power supply that can provide 45 amps of 5 volts. Something I don't have in any of the supplies I have sitting around, and something that's only gotten harder to find as power supplies have shifted to providing the bulk of their power on the 12-volt rail. Now that we're in here, we can also finally release the catch and pull that top hard drive out. I could stop there, but since we have this thing all pulled apart anyway, let's go ahead and break into the E-module to see what secrets it has waiting for us. To get a look inside, all we have to do is pop off the spring-fit panels that tuck into either side. Pulling off the outboard panel reveals the system mainboard housing the MIPS processor and a 16-bit audio mezzanine referred to as the Magnum Audio Option, both sitting under a dinky little case fan at the very bottom edge of the board. Above these, and taking up the bulk of the mainboard's area, is 16 RAM slots and a big old VME card slot. At the very top edge of the board is a ribbon connector which we can see as we pop off the opposite panel connects over to the graphics board sitting on the opposite side of the E-module. This board is known as Eclipse Graphics, and the Super Turbo name mentioned earlier indicates that this system has every available option installed, each of which is contained on one of these mezzanine boards. The largest board provides an extended set of bit planes, expanding the graphics to 32 total bit planes. 24 of these are actual color, while the other 8 provide for extended pixel attributes. The smaller board with the similar looking single inline memory chips is a Z-buffer option because, yes, in 1991 having a hardware Z-buffer on your graphics card was entirely optional. The double stacked board that plugs into this PGA socket is very interesting as it contains four chips known as geometry engines, and manufactured by Texas Instruments. The geometry engine is the bread and butter of SGI's 3D acceleration technology, and is essentially a vector processor for very quickly computing lots and lots of 4x4 floating point matrices. Without these, the system essentially only has 2D acceleration in the form of the raster engines which are contained on the main graphics board down below. I just want to butt in on myself to say that I had no clue about how any of the video hardware worked prior to this. Like, I had heard of the geometry engine and the raster engine before, um, but it was cool to look up a bunch of stuff and understand how all of these boards that I was looking at actually, you know, do their thing. So that's some pretty neat hardware to own, but as mentioned, for the few years that I've had this, I've never really been able to get it to fire up since I haven't been able to get a decent replacement power supply patched in. But after pulling this monster out for the first time in a long time to shoot this video, I broke down and bought a couple of industrial power supplies to see if I could take one more stab at getting it up and running. It's kind of a crapshoot since I have no idea if the rest of the machine is even in working condition, but I figured it was worth a try, and with that, I'll turn the narrative back over to my past self. Okay, I didn't really expect this to go this way, but I think it's time for a historical reenactment, because uh, things just got quite exciting in here. 
So I was going to save this as a bit of a stinger. Let me get that all in frame. So you can see the bizarre things I've been doing to this. Um, I was going to play with the power supplies as a stinger, but um, I just decided to install them and see what would happen. As you can see, it has turned into quite the cluster because this is a 12 volt supply. I need plus 12, minus 12, and a big hefty plus five, which is why most ATX power supplies, and I tried this guy before, just will not work. So this is a 12, and I thought it would do plus or minus 12. It can only do either plus or minus 12. So um, I have this doing the minus 12 right now. This is my five volt guy, which can do up to some amount of amps, but it's more than this needs. And this needs 45 amps. So we are good here. And then it turns out, you know, I still needed that 12 volts. So <laughs> I pulled in this supply as well, just to give a five volt line. And then I've been fiddling with this because, you know, the issue that I've had historically is that it just don't do jack. Um, the diagnostic light comes on on the front. There you go. So you can kind of make out maybe, yeah, there we go. If I can get a little shadow on it. Um, this one is diagnostic. The green one's powered. But diagnostic doesn't tell you anything. It just tells you, hey, there's a problem. And so I have not gotten any console output, any video output from this thing in all the times that I've tried to screw with it, which granted have not been many. On the back, interestingly, uh, these serial ports that I'm plugged into are... Um, they're female ports already, so they're crossed over. You don't need a null modem cable. So I have that going to Minicom on my laptop. And it's your usual 9600 8N1. <laughs> Here's my, I love CDE. This is my NetBSD as Unix as you can get ThinkPad setup. I went over here. Let's see if I can remember the sequence of events. So this cable, that's that cable that goes over to the video board. I popped that out. I was like, I'm just going to take everything out and see if it starts doing stuff. So I, I popped that out. I popped this, uh, that like audio mezzanine off and I left the RAM in, I believe. Now I'm trying to think. I think I left all the RAM in and then turned it on and it didn't seem to do anything. So I popped all the RAM out too after that. And finally over here, it said, didn't detect any RAM. And I was like, hallelujah, because that means the CPU is doing stuff. It's talking to the UART on here. It's reading memory. It's like doing stuff. Now, oh boy. Well, now you can actually see. Since it has been on, since I hit that button, it says diagnostics failed. It's hard to tell now because it's so shadowy in there, but this is now unplugged. It's it's close, but it's, it's out of there. There we go. And now, if I am to power this bad boy on, and then we just sit over here and we wait a minute. Literally a minute. About a minute, 15 seconds, give or take. And now we start getting stuff. So before, and I can't bring it back. Well, here's this. So you get a uh, SCSI device failed diagnostic, uh, can't find the graphics console, diagnostics failed. Weirdly, it says press key to continue, but that it doesn't do anything. Originally, I was getting some more messages, and as you can see, things don't look quite right here because there used to be a slightly different style battery in here. I had some 2032s sitting around, CR2032s. So I jammed one in there with some folded up uh, solder wick, <laughs> and it seems to work. But I was getting uh, unpassable errors originally where it was saying I can't set the real time clock, basically. Apparently that's an issue with the older ones that you just can't get past without a fresh battery. So that's fun. So I slap that in there. Those go away completely now. I get the SCSI diagnostic. Cool. So I decided the big moment was plug this back in and see if you know, it keeps going. See if it actually does the same diagnostic messages or if it's a fault on the video board. So let's turn it off and flip it over. Graphics card is back in. Power is going on. Pay attention over here. The, the big irony also of all of this junk is that apparently in 2019 on some SGI fan forums, and I never saw this before, I just found it earlier and I, hell if I know why it's never come up, but uh, there's a thread where a guy 
was talking about his personal iris and how he did his PSU replacement. That guy found one that had exactly the right rails. He found the perfect power supply. He gave the model number and everything. I could have just bought one of those. Pain in my butt. So now it just says diagnostics failed. You don't get any of this. Um, you don't get anything about the graphics. You get, you get nothing. Um, so that comes to the next big thing. The monitor I have that goes with this thing, that we'll try it at some point, uses these uh, bayonet connectors for BNC style video. But there is also, it's labeled composite on here, but it's, you know, a HD 15 VGA connector, basically. And I actually have a proper keyboard. This came with. The guy that I got it from did not have the mouse, but he did have a keyboard. Didn't have a cable. I had to, this is actually, they look like PS2, but they are not PS2. And this is actually a PS2 connector. It's just two PS2 cables wired together butt to butt as a, as a straight through, because that's what they use. It's actually a serial kind of keyboard, kind of like the LK201. Anyway, let's, uh, let's hook this up. All right, we got a keyboard. We got it plugged in. We got a monitor. We got it plugged in. We got power, I think. Yep, we got power. So now, Let's hit the power over here. I guess maybe I'll put this here. Oh boy. Power on. My friends, this is a sight that I have never seen before this day. This is crazy exciting. I thought this thing was probably completely screwed. Like it was sitting in my coworker's office probably since the late 90s. And obviously the power supply actually was dead, so this needed doing. But you know, I figured the boards might not be working. Something might be screwy. It looks like it's pretty much good to go. I mean, the graphics are graphicsing. And check this out, that press any key to continue actually does something on this side. So, so I guess, I guess the next thing is to jack in one of these hard drives, see if it boots. I'm just gonna jam them both in and see what happens. Okay, wish me luck. Fingers crossed, the discs are in, both of them. Nothing bad. Okay. Oh, it's booting Eryx 5.3. It's doing it, it's going, it's going, it's doing it. It's coming up. It's doing it. It's coming up. It's doing it. It's coming up. Interesting. It's having trouble booting a disc, or maybe this used to be connected to like an external CD or something like that. Ooh. Ooh. I'm sorry, this is so terrible, but I wasn't expecting to get this far anyway. Brother, would you look at that? I don't have a mouse, that's unfortunate. Oh, I can just type in my login name. Um, probably have to come back in here and... Nope, no password on, on Cliff's account, so perfect. There's clearly something slightly weird going on with the graphics hardware, because it's like, I don't know if it's everything on one plane that just has all the rows screwed up. That's interesting. But I mean, it works. Come on. This is from 1991. Um, I can't do much because, you know, no mouse. And I bet those mice are heckin' expensive. So I'll probably have to do another mouse hack like I did for, uh, oh, for the, the Vax that's behind me. I... That's, that's all I got. Um, that's really all I've got. We did it. But we, if we did it. I didn't expect to did it. 
So yeah, I didn't expect that ending. I really didn't. I was actually wondering, um, you know, if I was going to be able to have decent content out of just shooting a teardown of this machine, because I figured, honestly, it was probably dead. But basically, the second I started shooting this video, I got really excited about the machine again. Seeing something come over the serial console was actually, like, really, really surprising. I was not expecting that. So now I'm probably gonna have to play around with this some more. I have the keyboard, as you can see, which is super lucky, but I don't have a mouse. Actually, the guy who gave it to me said he will dig for the mouse, so maybe we will see, but you know, clearly I've had experience building an adapter for mouses and keyboards into weird uh, serial format. And maybe there's some poking around to be done with the video card too, because obviously there is like an address line or a data line screwed up somewhere. And maybe I could make it work. Who knows? But the fact that it, you know, has video and it runs and it has a working copy of Eryx is like blowing my mind. Anyway, all of that rambling aside, uh, usually I have a, well, here's what I'll do in my next video thing, but I'm kind of not sure. I knew I was going to do this. This was a long time coming. And if I get this video out, I'm going to feel very satisfied because this is one thing that made it into the trash pile in the basement when I started that you know, has basically been sitting there waiting in, in the back of my head, and now it's done. So what now? Well, probably I'll get back to that video card, which I, I've been doing some tinkering with, so there should be something interesting there. But anyway, until I see you guys again, thanks for checking out my stuff. Thanks for coming and chilling with me. It's always good to see you guys, and I will see you around the bend. Bye. <sighs> You know, usually I'm supposed to say something like funny or interesting at the end, but um, I'm just glad this thing works. Didn't think that would happen. Now I'm going to go look at some 3D models.